If you haven't already noticed, that in our country today, we are no longer supposed to talk about the war on terror. And it seems like that that has grown into the church because we no longer talk about a spiritual war that's happening here with us. A war that has far more casualties than any war on terror could be. And then the problem is that a lot of church members don't even realize we're in this war. That they don't understand what this is. I'm always reminded of uh, the first battle of Bull Run in the Civil War. That when the Confederate Army came to, to fight, the Union Army went south to fight them. And people made picnic lunches and they got put on their very best clothes. And they went down to watch whatever they thought they were going to watch. And they thought there was going to be some kind of party they were going to. But when people started getting shot and people started getting killed, they came rushing back to Washington, D.C. to get away from the reality of what's going on. Folks, we're involved in a, a terrible war. It's been going on ever since Genesis chapter 3. When Adam and Eve sinned and put themselves rebelling against God and, and the serpent, the devil, and he is real and he's here upon this earth and he is trying to destroy us. He can't, he can't destroy God. That's who he wants to destroy. But any of you that have children know that the best way they can get to you is how? Hurt your children. And that's what he's doing with God's children. That he is destroying them, harming them in a very great way where they will lose their eternity. The World Evangelical Encyclopedia states that since Jesus died upon the cross of Calvary, that'd be about 2,000 years ago, 43 million Christians have died because of persecution of their faith. Now what I have up here is a map and in the red, it shows you where the greatest amount of persecution is going on. And isn't it interesting that one of the greatest places here is Iraq, where we are supposed to just feed them from all of this. But can you imagine 43 million Christians, over half of those 43 million were in this last century. That what is going on in our world, if you are online and you want to check, there's a, a web page called Voice of the Martyrs. And it will share with you what's going on in the world today. Now, something that is very present that we probably know about is this problem of the Coptic Christians in Egypt. Have you heard that phrase here recently? That they're being extinguished in Egypt. That when the uh, government fell, now the Muslims are going after the Christians, not to convert them, destroy them. They don't want them to live. We hear all about how the Arabs don't want the Jews to be around, but the same thing is true of the Christians. That over half of the people that have died for their faith have died in this last century. Every day, over 300 people in the world are killed because of their faith. We need to become aware of what really is going on here. This war is going on in the hearts and minds of people and, and we lose if we allow Satan to have his way with us. And when Jesus comes here in this passage in John 15, the first part of John 16, he's going to tell them what's ahead of them. Okay? And he doesn't want them to be misled. He does not want them to be deceived of what's going to happen. Now we don't experience that here in this country yet. Yet. Okay? I don't know what the future holds. But I know that as long as we do not stand up for our faith, that we don't take this seriously where we're at in this world, that it's not going to improve. The only chance this world has is the church. That's what we're about here. That we are fighting this battle. Now, the battle, the war has already been won. Jesus did that at the cross 2,000 years ago. But Satan now is going to see how many that he can draw away. How many he can cause to be lost so that he might harm God in any way that he can. So when Jesus speaks here to the people, he begins first of all by saying, don't be shielded. Face reality. You know, there's a, a great desire, and, and, and if you don't have this desire, then you are unique, but there's a great desire to be accepted by people. There's a great desire to be in the in crowd, to, to be popular. Uh, it's kind of like 
these guys were talking at the coffee shop, they're three veterans, and they were talking about uh, people in their uh, world and things like that. And one of them says, you know, that my great-grandfather, at the age of 13, was a drummer boy in the Battle of Shiloh in the Civil War. And the other two guys were, were quite impressed by that. And one said, you know, my great-grandfather was with General Custer at Little Bighorn. And boy, they were really impressed about that. And the third one said, well, my, my grandfather wasn't in the military, but if he was alive today, he'd be one of the most famous people in the world. And the guy says, why is that? He said, because he'd be 165 years old. <laughs> we want to be popular. Honestly, think about it. That there, inside of all of us is this desire to be made known, to become popular, to do something of a, a great feat, to, to accomplish, to gain the popularity. You know, I was very upset this morning that I thought you guys were clapping for me, but Emily sent me straight. <laughs> Jesus wants us to know, though, that if we're going to make a stand for him, we're not going to win any popularity contest. That people, oh, they're, they're okay. I got a lot of friends that I talk to that are not Christians. And as long as we just talk about whatever, it's fine. But when Joe goes to the topic of Jesus all at once, I'm not nearly the great guy that they thought I was. <coughs> that they don't want to hear this. That they, they have their own ideas of what they want to do with their life. But we want to do that. Okay? And what is happening then in our society that it is pressuring us to conform. The Apostle Paul knew what he was talking in Romans 12. Be, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Years ago, when we, I moved here, we moved here to Watsika, I was told very quickly by a realtor that if you want to be accepted by this community, you need to live on the south side of town. Okay? Uh, we did one year, and that's never have lived on the south side of town after that. But after I'd been here for a while and saw the lifestyle of a lot of people here in Watsika, I decided I'm not really that sure I want to be accepted by what's going on that I see around me. That we as Christians need to be transformed. We can't conform to the ways of the world here. We have to decide for ourselves, do we want the applause of people or do we want a well done from Jesus but that day that we stand before him, we're not going to be able to have both. Jesus is not going to try to hide the truth from these guys. If they're going to follow him, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be very difficult, and we can look, and, and we'll talk in a few minutes about what actually goes on here. That if I have my faith in Christ, I have a different desire than what the world has. I have a different direction of my life than what the world, I have a de different destination from my life and what the world has. I have a different purpose in my life than what the world is looking at. Why do people hate Christians as much as they do? And Jesus gives us the answer. You know why? Because they hate Him. They hate Him. Now you'll say, well, I don't know that that many people really hate Christians. Just wait. Just wait. There's a great number of people in this community who would be very, very pleased if the church ceased to exist here. They would be very pleased because we put pressure on them. And that is part of what Jesus wants them to understand. That's, that's why we're going to see the opposition that we're going to have in our life here. Because they showed hatred to Jesus, did they not? My goodness, folks, what did they end up doing? Crucified him. They killed him because they couldn't take what he was saying. They could not accept the truth that he was preaching to them. So they had to get rid of him. If you can't stop the message, then go after the messenger. And what Jesus did in his words and his lifestyle, he exposed these people for who they were. There's the problem of sharing the gospel. That we become to realize who we really are when the truth is presented to us. So the only way I can keep that from happening is don't have the truth presented to me. Not hear it. Jesus mentions that as he talked with them. He exposes our sinfulness. There was a missionary that was in this particular tribal uh, village, and he had a mirror that he hung up to shave with, and the, the wife of the, the chief of that tr tribe came walking through and she saw it. And she couldn't figure out what it was. When she looked in it, she said, who is this ugly person? 
And the missionary explained to her what it was. It was a mirror, and the reflection that she saw was herself. And she took the mirror, and she threw it to the ground, and tromped it until it broke. That's where most people are at. And you see, when Jesus puts a mirror in front of us, it's not a popular thing to them. People really, for the most part, don't want to deal, don't want to take personal responsibility for their sin. So when someone confronts them with that, many times the response is not the positive one that we're looking for. And that's what the church does. You see, the godliness in a believer judges the world and condemns the world. That is found in Hebrews chapter 11 with Noah. That's one of the things that the writer of Hebrews says about Noah in Hebrews 11, that he condemned the world by his life, by his preaching. And we do the same thing. But there's no way that can be averted. You see, we don't want to offend people, but I don't know of any other way to present the gospel to them than to offend them with the truth, to convict them, not to, to turn them off, but to get them to understand the truth and need the change for that. You know, years ago, when I started preaching, Dick Yuki was the minister of the woman in Christ, and when I started going to ministry, he said, Joe, if you're preaching in a town somewhere and everybody likes you, you're not doing your job. You're not standing where you're supposed to stand at. And I've learned that through the years, that he is very, very true. The more that we are like Christ, the more the world is going to treat you like they treated you. There's the problem, you see. And it caused us to shut away a little bit, and we'll talk about that. You know, I, I was told many years ago that you can tell who a person really is by the friends that they have. But you know, I've also found out that you can tell what kind of person someone really is by their enemies, by those that don't like them, that those people that, that are contrary to the position that they really hold, to the character that they really have. And Jesus wants us not to be shielded, not to, to hide from the fact that we are facing this war that's going on that is coming to a climax here in John 15 and 16. He then tells us, don't be surprised. Face reality. <coughs> I think this is the key. You know, whenever we wake up in the morning, and we, I don't know if you watch the news in the morning, one of the first things that I do is get on and, and see what happened in the world and what's happening in the world then. But how many times I hear people, I'm shocked by what happened this day. And you know, my response is, why? Jesus already told us this stuff was going to happen. That we live in a world that's going down the tubes in a hurry. That we see people that are sacrificing the truth for whatever reason it is that is being sacrificed. So Jesus says, don't be startled by what you see going on in the world. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Folks, there's a time that we might have slipped by this, but Jesus is on the way to the cross. We call them the weeping women of Jerusalem. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that passage there. But as Jesus is there, they're crying, and he stops. He says to them, if they'll do this when the tree is green, what will they do when it's dry? What's he saying? If they'll do this to the Son of God, what do you think they're going to do to you? What do you think that this is going to be different? It's not going to be. It's not going to be. And he does not want us to be surprised by that. If we stand for Jesus, it is far more likely we're going to be persecuted than we are going to be popular. It's far more likely that people are going to react in a, in a negative way toward us. But that's not the point here. See, the point is that I believe in Jesus and I think eternity is great and I believe that I can live with Him forever if I stand in my faith. And that's far more important to me than being friendly with people or for everybody to like me because I don't take a stand on anything. Charlie Brown, Linus are talking. And Charlie Brown says something, he wants to do this particular thing and Linus says, well, you can't do that, Charlie Brown. You're too wishy-washy. And Charlie says, well, I could be wishy one day and wishy the next. <laughs> Don't be surprised when the world opposes you if you're standing for your faith. They did it to Jesus. You know, we look back in John 13, and Jesus says, the, the student is not above his master. Well, we thought that just meant about washing feet. But there's all the same conversation here. That we're not going to be above what Jesus went through if we stand for our faith. Satan will use anybody 
in the church, outside of the church, to do harm to his people. He will take any opportunity he has to cause problems, to oppose what God wants to do in his church, in his kingdom. They can't take their hatred out on Jesus. They'll take it out on you. Just a little sidelight. This isn't in my sermon, but this is free wisdom, I guess, in the years. You show me somebody that can't get along with other people, and I'll show you somebody that's mad at God. You show me someone that's constantly creating problems in the church or with family or friends, and I'll show you somebody that's angry at God for something. They've never come to terms with God. And that's what's going to happen many, many ways and many, many times here when we are opposed by that. A few years ago in camp, there was a gentleman that I got to meet, and I am certainly, I'm getting ahead of myself here, somewhere. It doesn't say I am, but I am. We'll just stick there. It doesn't matter anyway. His name was Palel. He lives in Burma. That is not Burma anymore. It is a country called Myanmar. And it, it, it worked out very beautifully because at the time we did not have the internet at camp. So I brought him and his family in. His, his family did not speak English at all, only he did. So he and I started talking about what it was like in Miramar. Okay. He explained to me that the church where he attended, his brother lives there too, and at the time they had these terrible storms and, and all kinds of problems that they couldn't get their... Uh, crop in. So he was in the United States trying to get some uh, farm equipment sent back to Miramar so they could have, could live, so they could eat. But in the process, he said that one of the things they always had to watch were these anti-Christian groups that would come through. In the church where he attended, or just outside of a town that he lived in, these people came in and killed all the elders of the church. Only because, why? They were Christians. Okay. They took the minister and buried him alive because he was a Christian. No other reason why. We see, we can't conceive of that, can we? we? Can't conceive of that. They had two leaders in another church, folks, that these men came and shot, shot, killed them, and threw them in the river. They didn't find them for months. They had no idea where they were at. They were killed because they were Christians. That's all. There was nothing else involved in this at all. And Paleo will tell me about all these stories. You know, Ken Henderson is a very good friend of mine. And he and Jim Small and Neil Irmore went to India here a few years ago and spent 10 days on a mission trip there. And after they left, the ministers that were helping them were beaten with an inch of their life. Why? They were helping the Christians. See, we can't conceive of that, can we? We don't understand that, that somebody makes a joke about us believing in Jesus and we have a tendency to, to back off. We don't really want to get into that kind of argument or that kind of discussion. But I want you to know that the time is coming if we don't. If we don't. Most of the apostles that Jesus is speaking of here will die violent deaths because of faith in Jesus. Only one that I know of that did not, that was the Apostle John, who died of old age. But even he was dipped in boiling oil at one time and survived that kind of torture. So when Jesus speaks to these people, they're going to experience this in a very, very real way. That we have to follow Jesus to experience and endure the conflict. That is where this is supposed to be, Hebrews 11, 32 through 40. You read that sometimes as the writer of Hebrews discusses and writes down for us what some of these people went through. Being cut, sawed in half, being boiled, being killed in, in a lot of horrible way. Not just to die, but to torture them. But they remain faithful to God in the midst of this. In fact, Paul will write to Timothy, anyone who lives a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So if I'm not experiencing persecution in my life, what does that mean about my faith? Don't be silenced by this. Don't be shielded. Don't be surprised. Don't be silenced. We cannot allow the opposition of people to keep us from speaking the truth. In fact, the church is supposed to be on the offensive. 
Matthew chapter 28, what we know is the Great Commission. The first word that Jesus says recorded for us in the Great Commission is what? Go. In fact, if you want to get technical, it's in a passive voice there, folks. He doesn't say go. He says, as you are going. He assumes that you're going to go. And here's what you need to be doing. See, we're on the defensive too much. We're always a back off and we're always having to respond to the world that's around us. That is not what Jesus intended for his church. Matthew chapter 16. He says, or upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's the attack of the church upon the gates of hell. They're not going to be able to stop the church going forward when we decide to be the church. We need to continue to speak because Jesus in Matthew chapter 10, and I believe it's also in Mark, if you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my Father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. And, and not getting technical again, but if you acknowledge, if you keep acknowledging, if you keep confessing is what Jesus says, then one day, one great confession he will make to me. But if I continue to deny him, there's going to be one great moment where he will deny that he knows me. It is the spirit that Jesus speaks of here that strengthens us to be able to witness to this world around us. You see, as far as the religion is concerned, we can believe anything we want, everybody's okay with that, but don't make a stand for Jesus. Now, I can tell you a lot of stories about that. Okay? There was a, uh, a school district in one of the Dakotas, I'm not going to get any more specific than that, that in this particular class, they allowed every religious group to come in and teach these fifth grade kids for two weeks, except the Christians can't. They allow every other religious group in the world to state their case before them, but the Christians were not allowed to come in to the school. Anybody watch Fox News this morning? Have you heard the news out of Cows, Texas? This is a neat story. Some cheerleaders in order to inspire the football team to play well, are making banners with scripture written on them. And of course, what happened? Well, somebody had to complain. I think it was Chuck Walton. Called Walton. No, no. It was Judy. <laughs> Complained. So they went to the cheerleader and said, nope, can't do it anymore. They went to court. The judge says, oh, yes, you can. It's free speech. You can speak, and now they're in this big battle, all of that. But this town is a town of 2,100 people. I wondered how they get away with this, because there's a local preacher that does a devotion to the team before every game. But then I thought, well, oh, it's Texas. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to mess with Texas, okay? But they, these cheerleaders now are in the middle of this great, great problem, trying to figure this out. They're not backing down. They're going to take this all the way. And they believe they can win the case. But one of the mothers opened up a Facebook account. And in two days, you know how many people are on their Facebook account supporting what they're doing? Anybody want to take a guess? 41,000 people have responded supporting these girls for what they're doing. Now, here's what I'm getting at is that we have an opportunity to stand for Christ and we don't do it because, we'll talk about that in a moment, I think fear and, and other things get into play. But you know, more times than not, what's going to happen if you make a stand for Jesus? This. You're going to see people coming out of the woodwork to support. You think you're by yourself, but you're not. And once you stand up and make the statement, day of Pentecost, when Peter gets up and preaches, 3,000 people become Christians. Not too long after that, Acts 3, when he gets up and preaches, 5,000 more become Christians. That if we would take the stand, if we would have enough courage and faith to stand by ourselves, we think, and we're not. We're not. Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit that's going to be there. Jesus speaks of, of all the support that he's going to give us. He told us, I'm not going to leave you by yourselves. So these people have 41,000 supporters on Facebook, all for what they do at this little town of 2,100 people. I think we should pray for them. I think we should encourage them. I think we ought to go on their face. I'm not a Facebook fan, but I think we ought to go on their account and put our name down, wouldn't we? Would we sign a petition? Would we do anything to make this stand 
as far as God's Word is concerned. We need to keep telling the truth. We keep living the truth. To tell the truth, not to dilute it, not to weaken it down. That I see in Acts chapter 4 and 5, the more intense the persecution was on these disciples, the more boldness they found. The more they went forward to the point that these men were threatened to be put to death because of preaching Christ. Would we go that far? Would we put our lives on the line? I mean, literally, if we knew that it would cost us our life to stand up and to preach, it tells us how far we've got to go in our faith. There's a Roman senator that recorded this in uh, Roman history, that he was very anti-Christian. He was very anti God. So he decided he was going to go through his little compound that all the people worked for him and anybody that became a Christian he rounded them up and he sent them to the Colosseum. Now one of the, the books in the Bible that would be good to read in the context of this is 1 Peter. 1 Peter is all about persecution and, and Christianity and where we stand. But he took all these people. Now, not getting sidetracked side too much here, you imagine what that must have been like? I want to stand there and watch their child being mauled by a lion. I mean, we're talking about hundreds and thousands of people to stand there, and you're next. And you see, Patty, the problem is, say, my grandchildren are there. All I have to do is deny I believe in Jesus, and they live. They can walk away. What do I do? What do I do? See, we need to prepare ourselves for those possibilities that are there, that we have to understand that. And he sent all of these people. And to his horror, when he looked down, he saw his wife get out of the stands and walk down in the center of that and grab one of the servant's girl's hands and was ready to die with the lion's tail. That's the type of faith. I don't know that Jesus is going to ask us to die for him, but I know he's going to ask us, command us to live for him. That's the key here. Whether we have to die for him or not, we don't know that, but we know he wants us to live for him. And finally, don't be sidetracked face reality. He says to them, I don't want you to be led astray. He knows, and, and the word there, I won't get into the technical word, but it means a stumbling block. He doesn't want them to be sidetracked from what they're supposed to be doing as far as their faith is concerned. Don't stumble. He said, don't back off. Don't get off mark here. That the pressures of the world and the persecution that we can encounter can cause us to stumble if we're not ready for it. You see, the church, folks, if I understand it correctly, is a spiritual support group that maybe we're not going through a difficult time in our, in our lives right now, but wait, it won't be long that we will. And there may, may be a time where it's pending where you need my help, but there's a time I'm going to need yours. And that's what this is all about, that we as Christians come together because there is strength. There is strength in numbers, and that's what the church is about. Two reasons, Jesus says, that people will persecute us. One is resentment. The other is ignorance. They don't know. They don't understand what is going on as Jesus tells us about it. Anybody have any idea who this is? John the Baptist. Doesn't it look like him, Joe? John the Baptist, what did he go through? Because he stood up and told Herod the truth, he will be beheaded. He could have backed off. He could have just let it go, but he chose not to because he had to be true to God. His ministry was to prepare the way for Jesus to come. And he couldn't be sidetracked by personal concerns. He needed to go forward in this. Jesus went through a lot of difficult times, but he kept his focus on God's will. And we must not allow the world to pull us down. We can't allow ourselves to compromise. We can't allow to be, try to blend into the world in which we live. In Ephesians chapter 6, that's Stephen. I forgot Stephen. <laughs> uh, remember what Jesus said here with Stephen that there are those that are going to kill you thinking they're doing service for God. Paul thought he was. Okay? And before we have a better understanding of what's going on, the terrorists do you understand? Believe they're doing what God wants them to do. Okay? And that's what Jesus says. 
that they're going to do this out of ignorance because they don't know the Father. They don't know Him. There are going to be those people that are going to oppose us simply because they don't understand. They don't know what really is going on. And that is why in Ephesians 6, Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. We need to have the protection that is there. That is true. But one of the things that he says we are to have is the sword of the Spirit. And the sword can be a defensive weapon, but it's also an offensive weapon. That is something that we need to attack with. The spirit, uh, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. That we need to continue to do that and not be sidetracked because of that. You see, when the world opposes us, it ought to strengthen our resolve and our courage. Anybody know who that is? His name is Randy Alcorn. And I'm not promoting him, but when it comes to heaven... He wrote a book called Heaven. has one of the better biblically-based books about heaven that I've read. Okay. He was a minister in a, a community that he, he, a large church, a large church. And he came to a, a point where there was this young lady that was not married, no father, no uh, father of a baby around. She was pregnant. He brought her into his home and let her stay there until she gave birth to the baby. And in the process of time, he got involved in a situation against an abortion clinic. And he uh, demonstrated against that clinic, and he got arrested. He was sent to jail. The clinic filed a lawsuit against him and the group that he was with, and they won. And they were awarded this fantastic settlement. And he stood up in front of the court and said to the judge, I'll pay a fine, but these people are not getting one cent of my money. So in order to secure that, he quit preaching. He went to a job that made minimum wage because then he didn't have to pay these people any money. If he is complaining about what's happened to him, his answer is no, I see God working in every facet of this. I see God working. He was willing to give up his way of life, all the money that he was making, all the opportunity he had because of his stand for his faith. <coughs> it was Judas' price to forsake Jesus. Anybody? Money. Money. Probably more popular problem than we would like to believe. What was Peter's? Price for forsaking Jesus. You know, again, but why? Fear. Fear. Absolutely. Folks, nine times out of ten, when we fail to speak up when we should, and that pretty much the motive is fear, that we're afraid of what the response might be. Well, the question is, what's my price? What does it have to get to before I will stop? When, what has to happen so that I will refuse to stand for Jesus? There comes a time, rapidly I believe, when we as Christians are going to decide where we stand at. Are we with Him or are we without Him? Are we going to make that decision once and for all that we are with Him or are we without Him? One little quick story, and we'll run through this one quickly, but there was a man named Polycarp. He was a, a disciple of the Apostle John. He, he preached in a city called Smyrna. And he was not popular with some of the ungodly people. And they wanted him dead. So they went to arrest him. And when they came to arrest him, the soldiers came. He made them sit down and eat a meal with him. He, he refused to let them come to his home unless he showed some kind of hospitality. So these very men that are going to lead him to his death, he makes them sit down and eat. And then he asked him if he could have an hour to pray. And when that time is over, in fact, part of the story says that the soldiers end up letting him have two hours. And they couldn't understand why they were here, here to kill this man. That he was one of the, the neatest guys they'd ever met. Why would we need to kill him? So they took him back to the king. And he said to Polycarp, curse God, and I will let you go. And he makes one of the greatest statements. His statement is this. For 86 years I have served him, and he has never done me wrong.
how then can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? Has Jesus ever done you wrong? How can we possibly deny him? There are people that need the message that we have, people that want the message that we have. There are those that don't, and that's the way it is. But the response is not the determining factor of whether I share the gospel message or not. I'm commanded by Jesus. You know, as Randy was speaking, he talked about our responsibility, and it's absolutely true. But folks, one of the things we've got to keep in mind is our privilege. We get to speak the truth of God to the world that needs it so badly, so badly. So we cannot get off track here. We have to remain faithful to what God has for us. Our hymn of invitation and dedication, the song is, We Will Glorify Him. And that is what God wants of us to do, is to glorify Him in our lives. To glorify Him so that those around us will know that we are Christians. Let's stand together as we sing together.